And we're live. Hey guys, welcome back to Whiskey Charlie, our monthly war game chat on YouTube. I'm Mo from Mo's Game Table. And joining me tonight are my co hosts, everyone's favorite Gimp with the Limp, Nate Rogers, the Gimpy Gamer. Nate, how's it going? Going great. Nice to see you all again. And the Wargaming Wizard from Oz, Kev Sharp from the Big Board. Hey, Kev, how's it going? Good, mate. How are you? Not too bad. And tonight we have a very special guest, Natalia Wojtovich from. Uh, Wargaming Experiences, her new book, we're going to discuss that. I, I didn't mean to say from, because she's not from Wargaming Experiences, but she just wrote a book for uh, called Wargaming Experiences, and we're going to talk to her about her new book, as well as her experiences designing games and running games for NATO. Welcome to the show, Natalia. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. And uh, I guess I have to wait for a cool nickname, so I will uh, keep it for the end of the show. <laughs> We will come up with something for you by the end of the show. But uh, yeah, no, the uh, new book, Wargaming Experiences, which you so graciously sent me a copy of, is a fantastic read and um, really enjoyed it. And what was the uh, impetus for you to, to write this book? Well, thank you for the compliment. I think there was a um, couple of reasons uh, that you also see in the preface of the book, but... Um, more or less, I wrapped up uh, a project of five years and I wanted to keep summary of it as well as um, a lot of lessons that came out of that time and um, to just summarize what I have experienced because on one side I saw that uh, when you are entering wargaming it is quite a steep curve and there is not a many consensus on very basic things. So I wanted to at least describe these dilemmas that I see when you are entering and more or less as well how I grew into designing and what other people can uh, learn from it and take it forward because I see that more as a conversation than as a monologue. And that's why I thought, all right, it's a good time to write it down as well as um, I also looked at the solutions that I was proposing and I thought the longer I wait with it the more I forget about it <laughs> <laughs> so I thought okay when I was looking through my notes yeah I fixed it already but I have not remembered it after a while <laughs> so I thought that would be neat to um, keep it in one place um, as a good summary and in the end uh, i would have to ask you if, if you have already read it but i think that was uh, achieved yeah no i I've, I've read most of it i've not finished it yet but i've read most of it and uh i did read in the preface you were talking about you know the what caused you to write the book and you you really write everything out in the book in uh you know pretty clean order too like i'll just because i don't want to mess it up here at the beginning you start to say introduction why war game then you go into the definition of what is a war game, and then you move the way all the way through that into war games that you've facilitated over the years and your experiences with them. And you know it's different from what we do as commercial, you know, hobby war gamers versus what you do on the professional side of things. What? Uh, how many commercial or hobby games? I just say commercial because we look at you as professional on that side of things, and we're, what we do is commercial uh, hobby. Uh, what are the differences that you've seen by playing hobby war games and professional war games? Well, I would say that the purpose is the main thing that differentiates the two um, in the way that, um, of course, in the, the hobby part, fun is the priority. So once I asked on Twitter what makes a good war game and um, how do you facilitate it well, and somebody told me, I don't understand the question. You facilitate it well if people have fun. Whereas on the professional side, fun is secondary and you have to look on the expectation of what is to be achieved. And I also would say that in the hobby war gaming, um, all the people that meet around the table are there because they already like to do that. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you do it professionally, which I would say is in a work time, then you might encounter different types of players and uh, they would not always be uh, friendly towards this method. 
And that was for me also the reason to write out all the conversation I had. Why do you use wargaming? What is wargaming? How does it look like? Because we cannot assume that everybody already has um, initial uh, experience with wargaming. So that was the reason that I went from, um, you could say, basic stuff. But as I mentioned, I don't think it is established yet. It is just starting up towards practical applications and more structural and formulas that I was using to uh, approach different cases and as well what I learned from it and what can be observed when you compare them. So in, in short, I would say that the purpose and the players are um, different but there is also a lot of commonalities so um, that is something that I would say you could play the professional war game and still enjoy it mm -hmm. and as well for the professionals that are using um, a lot of scenarios that are already out there they also look into what is on the commercial side i know i am definitely uh, looking there to see uh, what is being developed so uh, on that uh, note i would say that it is a big discipline and all the other parts have their contribution so i'm i'm very happy to mix them <laughs> well, i have one comment and then i'm going to pass it off to my two co-hosts for a question but you know it's funny you you said player and i think you know reading your book and then also looking at the professional side of things when it comes to war games i wouldn't say player as much as i'd say participant because you're pulling in people that like you said that maybe feel uneasy in the situation they're civilians they don't normally deal with or even consider uh, thinking about war games or war, you know, and you're pulling them into a situation where, you know, you have to think outside the box. You have to think outside your comfort zone. And what would you do in this situation? And how would you work with local authorities and law enforcement, you know, law enforcement, government officials, as well as the military to make sure you have all of the, you know, essential services as well as law and order. And of course, Homeland, Homeland Defense as well. So there, there a lot of things are posited there that are, are pretty interesting was there a slide to a question or you would yeah no no i was making a comment now you guys go <laughs> all right i'm gonna say um i am curious how you actually got involved with this because i don't anticipate that a lot of people would just pick up and say yeah, i think i'm gonna do war gaming for nato so i'm assuming <laughs> there's like a background there somewhere that got you uh started down that path do you mind telling me what it was uh, yeah, sure. I will just uh, start with that. Um, well, I have joined um, the NATO Center for Civil Military Cooperation and I started in the training and education branch. But very quickly I noticed, um, well, you could say a very standard but also very boring practices. So a lot of the courses were lectures driven and they were also outdated. And I was um, working on something called global programming, which was aligning the training needs with the uh, solutions. And at that time I noticed, yeah, there is um, a lot of practice missing and there is virtually no connection between mission experience and what is being proposed in the classroom as standardized training. And at that time I was um, going deeper into the topic and um, wrote a proposal to uh, do more practical uh, exercises and I framed it into Wargaming already. And uh, we presented that project with my boss at that time uh, to start a four year development uh, into NATO system. And that was approved after a year of um, efforts. And that pretty much started what uh, I was doing for the next uh, four years. And if you ask me, where did it come from? Well, um, that journey was a bit longer. So already a couple of years back, I was uh, quite interested in maneuver warfare theory as well as exercises. So I started with that academic angle to look into the discipline. 
And when I got the chance, then I proposed to do something about it in practical terms. And fortunately, uh, that was possible. And I see that it is developing very slowly uh, within NATO because it also is a huge organization with high bureaucracy. So any innovation is uh, crawling. It will not be running. But um, that uh, got me quite uh, far into um, implementation. So after the first war game was successful, it created, I would say, waves within the organization. So people noticed it and we got more and more requests to do something like that. And with that, I was very uh, happy to continue. Were you um, involved in just the theoretical side? So like the tabletop and and laying out the, the units and stuff like that? Or did you actually get to go out into the field and experience some of the, the practical? Because when I was in the military, our war gaming was suiting up with either uh, laser tag basically on our rifles or using paintball and we would war game certain scenarios like breaching a house or stuff like that. So did you get to get physical or was yours more just the theoretical side? I would say uh, both. Um, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> well, um, I have to admit that um, we did not have many um, tabletops as I think you would translate it into a kind of game in the box where you open it and play it out. We had a lot of um, exercises that were group exercises. So we would have teams playing against each other and doing something about a given scenario. And that was mostly based within the location. If we went outside, that was attached to a physical exercise that had more components to it so then you could do additional tasks within wargaming uh, that gives you a good experimental use and then again you would have to come back to what was the purpose of a given war game because if we played on strategic or operational level then of course the tactical uh, skirmishes were not the main focus, but if they were, then we would uh, come back and try to uh, check it with reality. Uh, but that also depended whether we got the resources for it or not. Um, and that was, uh, let's say, the, uh, the connection. So every time I would make a war game, I would anyway uh, trace back uh, people that are involved in a given topic or area, capability, whatever is the uh, focus. And I would interview them on whether this represents the truth or whether it was just um, a model representation that is not complete. So I think that is really important to uh, come back to the basics there. And there is no way around it. So you should always tour what you are playing on the professional level. If it's not only for fun, then uh, I think it's a big responsibility not to overstate something that is not correct. And I saw it with a lot of games that were, let's say, uh, trickling down from the academic level. And I spoke about it with other presentations as well. Uh, there is an example of African uh, war game that basically uh, said to the participants that the biggest problem you will encounter is malaria and gave them tips how to uh, protect themselves. But if somebody was deployed to Mali, he will have a very different problem because that is the deadliest UN mission on the ground at the moment. So if you now misrepresent it and tell it to your participant or player or a person that takes this as a training and they assign a level of truth to it, then I think this is very dangerous. And uh, that's why it cannot be a standalone if you are speaking about professional uh, wargaming, in my view. Mm -hmm. Because as I said, there's a lot of examples where this went uh, wrong. The, I don't want to monopolize you. I know Kevin's like <laughs> jumping Kevin's like, to, shut to up already. Them. I want to go. Uh, I'll ask a question in a sec. Go ahead, Kev. Cool, cool. So I had a two-part question. Now I'm gonna, I was going to do two questions, but I'll do one question with two parts so that I can get in before they jump back. 
but, uh, <laughs> but your, you mentioned that your, uh, you had an interest in maneuver theory, right? Uh, uh, in uh, maneuver theory, right? So you, dis you discussed that at one point. Are the games that you design, are they focused on geopolitical level types of situations? And how do you, how would you parlay any of that into your interest in maneuver war theory at all? Or are, that, or are the games more focused on uh, a tactical, more tactical uh, theater wide situations? So I'm just curious about the scope of the scenarios you're designing and are you designing for effect or, or is it just like you said, uh, a preset of conditions? Sorry, that was a long <laughs> no, no, I think that was broad, but uh, very yeah. much applicable. Um, well, I didn't say much yet, uh, maybe what uh, got into the book, but I will say more about um, the whole project. So um, I think there is nine war games that uh, I described in the book because I thought they were important, but I would say after four years, I ended up with around 30 prototypes, and that meant um, that the spectrum was quite uh, broad as well. So at the highest level, we had political uh, strategic exercises. Um, there was quite a fair number of operational, and I would say around 10% was uh, tactical. So those were uh, indeed the classic duels with um, the hexagons and with the counters and uh, with representation of basically a platoon level um, of different sides. Whereas if we went uh, up to the higher uh, levels, uh, on operational level, we would look at the region and uh, what would be possible plans to either attack it or defend it. So you would play around with your uh, headquarters and um, bigger uh, groups, battle groups. Uh, whereas on the strategic political level, I did some work on uh, so-called strategic direction south. And that was for NATO at the time, Middle East, North Africa. And as you know, I would also say that there is a lot of uh, issues there and the learning process is quite broken. So uh, for us, the question was, what would be the relation uh, between development, population and security? So a lot of times you noticed, for example, we build the wells and then we bomb them. So, OK, how can you represent this? Uh, issues in the game and make people think about uh, sequencing and priorities and we also added a um, you could call it population factor so um, if you would lose the support of the population your actions would be less effective so in that way we represent it all right um, if you are perceived as the enemy you will not uh, win in the long term and uh, you could, let's say, improve and develop within uh, the big region. And I have to say that although the game uh, was quite well received, the audience for it was so small that in the end it is on a dusty shelf somewhere now in headquarters and awaits its glory. But. <laughs> Okay, that's, that's, that's very insightful. That's you. bureaucracy for you right there, right? <laughs> Something well, amazing hidden on a shelf. Sorry, go ahead. Did, oh. did, you have another, did you have another part to that question, Ken? No, oh, you, you just combine it into one big, broad question. I, oh, no, because I wanted to get to some audience questions here. We do sure, have okay. some here. Matt Chesnut is asking, is there an audio version of the book, of your book, Wargaming Experiences? I do most of his reading while mowing the lawn. So he's wanting to see if you can come out and help them out mow the lawn by having the audiobook version of your book? Uh, well, the answer is not yet. Um, for now, it is a paperback. In September, I am expecting the ebook. So I would say audiobook would be following after that. Um, but I am not sure is, if there is enough interest. So I, I note much uh, request and I will um, forward it to the publisher, but we have to see. 
um, whether that is picked up or not. Well, we'll hope we'll hope that it does get picked up because I think that would be uh, really interesting. And anybody mowing the lawn or driving into work will be able to listen to it. <laughs> Harold says he's um, very interested in Natalia and wargaming experiences, so he's in the audience tonight. Wargame HQ, he says uh, he just bought your book. <laughs> and uh, it is waiting actually on the table. I will uh, ship it tomorrow because it is the signed version. So, nice. Very uh, nice. I think it should arrive seven to day, ten days, technically. So there's your book right there. It's right behind her shoulder. <laughs> yeah, it is right there. <laughs> and I had a couple more. I know there was one here. I got to scroll down to find what Harold had asked one. He was talking to me about fighting trains. And I said, no, we're not going to fight trains here. You just drop casts on them and then you don't worry about it. Um, but I do have one question you were talking before about, you know, as I before I get down to these other questions, you were talking about civilians, bringing civilians into these um situations that you do with professionals we all kind of as war gamers some of us are veterans some of us are not but we all have a, a shared interest in military history we have a, a broad understanding of it if not a specialized understanding in some instances um for civilians they're introduced in something out of you know out of their realm like i was saying before have you found anything that surprised you when bringing in civilians into this, uh, into these war games where they think outside the box, they think completely different than a military person would. And they surprise you with a pretty interesting uh, solution to a problem that you've put in front of them. Good question. Well, um, let me start from the beginning. When I uh, started the project, I also thought that um, we should try to move a lot of elements within the standard war games. And one of them that I tried to push was adding new players to uh, war games. And that was indeed civilians or the local population. And uh, on the other side, uh, NGOs, uh, humanitarians, so organizations that are in the uh, conflict area, but rarely do get any um, avatars or uh, icons on the board. So that was something I did with most of the war games to show that it is part of the um, area and it influences, of course, how um, forces win or lose. And so that was already easier, let's say, if we had uh, this representation because it brings a different perspective to uh, what we are gaming. And it is realistic, so I think we owe it to the uh, personnel to also show what kind of uh, problems uh, stem from that differences. And then if you ask me, all right, what about civilians that play war games? Uh, mm. Scenarios where they are already present. But most of the time, I have to say, we uh, try to bring people out of their comfort zone, which meant we try to make military play the civilian side and the other way around. So they would understand what are the rules of engagement or code of conduct in terms of uh, civilians. And they would kind of meet each other halfway. And there is a lot of observations on that topic, I would say not only mine, and indeed that brings the level of understanding higher but also shows for example civilians seeking neutrality so if they would have a choice in the war game they would go uh, for something that does not uh, decisively end the situation they would try to negotiate between it or sometimes slow down uh, the escalation um, but there was also an opposite effect, and that was in uh, war game on nuclear forces, where they, hmm, let's say, hypothetically escalated to see what was the uh, worst case scenario. So you were very aggressive. <laughs> let's just see how this turns out. <laughs> that was pushing back uh, guys to not annihilate the capital city. So uh, I really, really see that this is necessary to find the language between or a space between where you can discuss um, what are the realities of both because each group brings a different perspective. And mm -hmm. I can also give an example that comes back uh, in the book that was uh, a scenario from the um, Battle of Mosul. And at the time that different sides were battling out for the center of the city, 
there was a quarter of a million civilians jammed into um, cellars, basically, because they received the uh, warning that uh, the coalition forces are coming into the city and they were advised on the leaflets to stay at home, to close the doors and stay at home. But after that came the air raid. So that was quite a deadly trap that was um, created. And with that situation, I have introduced the local population as an active player. So that means they could actually influence um, the red team and the blue team in at least in their thinking, because I don't mm -hmm. think or I don't believe that changed their decisions, but they could see what was the influence on the ground uh, when they were making them. Uh, so I think that that is uh, really a clue of uh, many of the war games. And you also see that coming back uh, in the coin series that if you lose on this front, the whole war is uh, prolonged and it is very often not um, anymore able to be decided. And that is what uh, also came back in Mosul. So, we had uh, three rounds that um, spoke about the kinetic side and um, the victory in terms of dominating the terrain. But after that, we had a fourth round about reconstruction of the uh, city and the population that was um, very much exposed or escaped from that area. And also identification of the enemy within the population uh, that stayed. So that fourth round was something that a lot of participants uh, have seen for the first time, um, which maybe is also a statement about our exit strategies and long term thinking. So uh, I was very curious to see how that um, how that played out. And there was a lot of consensus that we need to do more there. Well, I got to say, I'm thrilled to hear you talking about um... You know, the opposing forces hiding in with the civilian population because we experienced that a lot. I served a couple of tours in Iraq and, and that happened to us all the time. A lot of them would dress up in the traditional civilian garb or they drive taxis or sometimes they would dress up as women and, and we couldn't tell who the bad guy was and it was very obvious why they did it because it puts us in a, a lose-lose situation. We either potentially hurt a civilian that we don't want to, or we don't know that this is a, an actual bad guy and they catch us with our, our head in the ground, you know? So that it's great that you guys are actually wargaming that. But something you mentioned earlier kind of stuck with me, and you were talking about the academic level and their thought processes on wargaming and it coming down and you noticing that what they were proposing seemed not to line up with reality. And I would agree with you on that because it always we uh, Mo, what was that saying? The uh, no plan survives com. Oh yeah, uh, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. Yeah, yeah, it, never. And that's it's a very true statement. So, hundred percent with you on that. That uh, the academics just don't see it. And did you find that to be like a really common thread? So is there like a uh, a group of think tankers who are sitting around who just have no experience and then they're like oh this is what we think is a good idea and you kind of look at it like no 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 this is a bad idea we're going to change all this yeah i think that this saying could be also applied here and you could say that no war game survives first contact with practitioner ah yeah it's what has to be bridged and Indeed, I've seen a lot of examples where designers are projecting their own thoughts into the rules and then they think it's a result. So I would say you have, um, that was a very bad war game I saw, but the rule was you have only one minute to discuss um, distribution of your resources. And we played around four rounds and um, between the rounds, I think we could in the end, crack it. So we would say, you go to north, I go to east, and you take the medication, and I will take the equipment. So I would say it was not an uh, unbreakable system. And then I hear the conclusion of the war game that there is a problem with communication. 
And this is of I, course false. That is your projection from the rules that you made yourself, and then you concluded that we had the problem, which was completely not true. And also, I would really <laughs> contest where did you take it from? So why is that the rule in the game? Because you could introduce it if it was based on any uh, real life situation, and I did that many times. Um, but if you have just um, made it because you thought it's interesting or it's a good challenge, then you have to present it this way, that um, despite communication block in the rules, participants are able to fix it by round three. And then it is not realistic, but it is at least compliant with what was happening. Mm -hmm. And there is... Uh, a lot of misconceptions that uh, are lost in translation. And there is also, let's say, a big problem where people translate previous wars into current or future problems. Mm -hmm. So you would see that coming back a lot. And um, the remedy for me was, uh, as I mentioned, to uh, either experience it myself or I would interview people that uh, have done that. Uh, and I also tested the war games with very um, varied audiences. So um, anybody should be basically able to understand what um, the game is about and comment whether it is true or not. So you would not get stuck into your own head and just um, project what you think is um, right and then the worst example of that I had uh, was actually a big project that was a computer simulation where people chose ABC as an answer. And the problem was already coded in it. So they wanted you to choose the answer they thought is right. Yeah. Whereas I even didn't agree with the problem. And I tried to speak to the designers uh, because I flagged this solution as a danger to our personal because of that misconceptions. Um, but the designers just kept on saying the same things only louder. So I was not able to uh, get in a conversation with them. And then I said, OK, if I take now a soldier and show him the system, um, either you are um, really creating a harmful picture for them or they would tell you you are wrong. But both of these results, of course, are uh, not what you want to achieve with um, the professional working. So it's kind of a presumptive strategy, isn't it? So you have a, a concept that's built around a, a an abstract idea about what some relative truth is that is then applied into a system and then you're expected to go game it and then prove that their theory works, even though it may be completely divorced from reality. So so oh, can we can we say that you're at the forefront of trying to put realistic, uh, realistic wargaming, uh, professional wargaming together versus uh, more, more uh, presumptive uh, things? That I would say that that um, in the end that story had uh, maybe a good and a bad ending because um, I went to the commander and I told him what is the actual danger if he releases this game as a pre-deployment training and he listened and he shared this opinion once he saw that um, solution. So that was, uh, let's say, fine to uh, indeed take it out of the equation. But on the other side, if you imagine what kind of resources and uh, time was taken to construct it, then uh, it can um, lead to a lot of anger. Because um, that was, let's say, a time, and I see that coming as well in phases where scientists or industry gets interested for five minutes. So there are people that will come in, want to make a three month project, and then maybe commercially make uh, some money and then get out. And this was the case that uh, indeed there was a couple of um, scientists that said they will make a war game and uh, I think they planned it for a couple of months and then ended it. So they didn't they were not interested in any reality check and 
that is maybe why they talked over me and they were not interested in uh, learning any lessons about it so if they would make an iteration testing iteration testing i think it would quickly come back that this is not right. realistic right. this was your indeed assumptions and they were very wrong because um i'm not saying you you particularly need combat experience from that place but uh, it helps if you know what you are um, modeling so at least you should have people on your team that uh, know what is happening there uh, and then uh, that was not the case so that was purely academic um, theory and a very bad one um, so it exists on paper but it does not uh, compare to reality in any way and that is why I think it always has to be calibrated um, and you can do it different ways. But the most important part as a designer is you are open to it and you are chasing it because, uh, of course, we do not want to uh, change the design or sometimes destroy it. But I have actually chosen an opposite way. So I've made a number of prototypes and I played them against each other. So you would see which part of the solution is good or which part is bad and why. So I did a number of comparative experiments where I tested whether the historical occurrence scenario is better, whether digital or tabletop is better, whether the facilitator plays the main part or the war game. So I facilitated the game or I took my colleagues, they did it, and then we compared um, what were the uh, evaluations. So we would know whether it is an individual presentation that is very uh, good or it is the solution itself. So I called it the unnatural selection where we had a lot of options which we could kill off and then go into the uh, best solutions that are confirmed over time. and. I can say that um, in this situation, uh, I had access also to commanders of the given uh, area or headquarters. So I could basically ask them, is that the correct requirement we are training or not? And what are the um, biggest problems they notice with the person that is assigned? And from there, we could go into uh, truth. And we could also say that um, yeah, once the commander uh, is content with uh, how realistic the war game is, then uh, it would be difficult to dispute it, not on the premise of their rank, but on the premise of what they perceive as a priority. Mm. Now we get uh, another question from the audience here. Harold Buchanan, a war game designer himself, he says here, how long are the players involved in a NATO war game? How many players? And what are the, what is the variety of disciplines uh, of the players that are involved? All right, Harold, thank you for joining and thank you for the question. Um, how long are the players involved? It depends what is the war game. So the longest uh, time I was given was two days to play out a war game. On average, it would be three hours and then that is uh, normally the ending of the training. So that would be like an end test where they can apply the knowledge they supposedly gained. Uh, how many players? Uh, the smallest group I had was uh, six people. And that was maybe on the political level. That's why it was such a small group. The biggest one, 100. So I would then classify it as a mega game. Um, the variety of disciplines uh, is basically endless. So we had uh, special forces operators and we had uh, legats, legal advisors. Um, so it depends on the um, purpose of the war game and what is being trained. If we involved um, the social layer, and uh, then we had much broader training group than if we would only train uh, contingency plans or um, this. <coughs> so I would say uh, we always try to get diversity because that opens up uh, different perspectives. Um, but then again, it can also be misleading. So it depends on the scenario very much. So and we got another one here. Uh, Wargame HQ says, 
Uh, does Natalia have multinational counter counterparts that share her role or work on her team within NATO so that they can wargame the cooperation uh, or the cooperation between command control and logistics? Hmm. Well, um, maybe I will clarify the first part. Um, I have moved to a university in The Hague as of March. Mm -hmm. So all of the book and all of the experiences I'm sharing is uh, basically from the last five years. Um, so I would have um, maybe a lot of people that share my role as university lecturer, but uh, <laughs> as a board game designer in NATO, I'm afraid that's um, a no. And the problem there is uh, mm -hmm. the digital parts, uh, the simulations are very much outsourced. So you would have uh, designers outside of NATO and you would have operators inside. Mm -hmm. And for the tabletops, um, I would say that headquarters very often either organize it themselves or they um, ask somebody that would be in my position, but it is not a fixed um, structure yet. Maybe it will be uh, developing. Uh, I know that there are some works in, uh, in Norway to establish such capability and then uh, they would be able to speak about it more, but they are not yet um, operational. As for my team, I uh, can say it openly that I was a team of one so I was uh, at the one woman show fit in one office and very often um, my colleagues assisted me, but that was more on premise of willingness than of um, official assignment. Uh, so that was how it was uh, run. And unfortunately, it was not um, institutionalized. So the project ended and wargaming. So, so wargaming hobbyists don't have to worry about anything here because even the professional wargamers don't get the respect we deserve. So <laughs> it's it's systemic <laughs> everywhere. <Yeah. laughs> it's just part of the whole gig. <laughs> and then Nick had a question here. We'll last uh, one last question for the, uh, right now from the audience. He says, "What are some of the objectives of the war games that you have developed? Planning, logistics, coordination of combined arms, or coalition ops, so on and so forth." Um. Hmm. I would say that logistics are very much uh, belonging with operations research. So they were simulated uh, in the digital uh, solutions because that is pretty much uh, counting and distribution lanes. So that was not necessarily included in my objectives. Um, and I struggled to come up with one answer because every war game had a different objective. But yes, planning was uh, included, coordination as well. Um, there was a lot of objectives that pertained to host nation and NATO. So how to um, basically mobilize forces, take them to the right place and uh, how the international agreements would work um, with uh, use of force on a NATO territory because the expeditionary forces, I think we have uh, covered, at least in theory, in practice, mm -hmm. I think else. So the coalition operations um, indeed took most of our efforts. And I would also say, I particularly looked at the point of escalation. So we have now a lot of actions that are below the threshold of war and how you could um, gain that point where it is turning from hybrid or deterrence activities into open conflict. Or if it is not turning into open conflict because it is not attributed to a particular player or faction, then uh, what kind of counter actions do you have in your sleeve? So the objectives were depending on the level, uh, very much focused on defending um, NATO's territory, but also the population. So if it was targeted, as in the case of one of the war games that traced the Scripple case study, that was the uh, British citizen at that time um, that was murdered uh, in UK in Salisbury by Russian toxin. 
and now mm -hmm. everything about it is, of course, uh, hmm, pres the first precedent of such uh, case. And I have um, constructed a scenario where that would be the focus. So the population is attacked, not the territory. It's not the tax at the border. It's something that grows under our lines and uh, we have to fight it back and where if we consider that NATO has military advantage, you have an intelligent enemy that is looking into your weakness. So he's trying to push against um, places where military would not be um, the right solution or would be not um, effective. And that was what was a lot of times um, war gained. Nate? Uh, I was curious about the security precautions you guys would take, because I would kind of figure that you wouldn't want everyone to just know what you're wargaming. So, you know, for us, we've got security clearances that you have to have depending on your, your occupation. So did you guys have a background check system you would do on the people that you wargamed with? And if so, like, what was your classification level and how did all that work? Hmm. It, it reminds me your question of, of such sketch that was shown uh, in the US, where the general is announcing that our forces are landing, but they cannot comment where precisely. And the journalist is asking, yes, but where? And he says, well, I cannot comment on it because um, that would put, of course, the person in danger. But the journalist, he says, OK, but I'm curious, where did they go? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a back and forth conversation. Um, so depending on the information that is in the war game, indeed, uh, then a different uh, security level applies. And uh, it can be anything. So if you have open source information, uh, it can be played out um, in an open environment. But the deeper you go into sensitive information, uh, the more secure will be the uh, area and the deeper the background checks on the participants indeed. But uh, the details of it uh, can be conveyed by uh, other more professional people than me. Oh, so you weren't involved with uh, the background checks. They just brought you people and like, these people are clear. You can war game with them. <laughs> They're clean. Then well, forget I, it. They bring in the war gamers and say, they're just a bunch of clowns. You can play with these guys. <laughs> no, no, it, it, of course, depended on the uh, war game and the setting. Um, so it, it was very much, um, again, purpose bound. Uh, mm -hmm. what would be war games um, dictated who would war game and uh, the information in the war game would dictate uh, how far the security has to be involved so where did you take everything once you were done so let's say you war game this we're we're invading africa and we're going to take it over so we've taken over africa and you've got your little battle plan what did you do with your your battle plan when you were done with it did that just get sent up to the nato brass or filed away in case of, you know, how did uh, all of your reports end up working out? Uh, again, depending on the purpose, uh, the reports uh, were, of course, uh, as always, pushed up the chain of command. So the commander would see what uh, his personnel was doing, basically, for the given amount of time and uh, depending on the usability of the conclusion. So. Um, if you had it on strategic level, then we would say which kind of strategies were proposed and what are the limitations or effectiveness that we have noticed within the given parameters of the war game. On operational level, you could see how does interoperability work uh, or on tactical level, you would simply look um, what were the details of uh, different situations. And uh, then you also have to uh, get down on earth and realize that this report probably is not read. So maybe 5% of the executive summary is uh, actually looked at. And um, if in that space you can uh, smuggle something interesting and applicable, then your reports have a chance of having an impact uh, within the organization. But I think it is extremely limited if I am a realist for a minute. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's just sad. I'm sure you've had a great impact. So you never like watch the news and see them like doing some combat formation. Like, oh, I, I did that. I wargamed that. That's my design. 
<laughs> I would like to believe that dream, yes. <laughs> Kev? Um, so I'm curious about uh, the discussions and the modeling you did around low level conflict, uh, sort of the under the under the war threshold. How do how do the various parties react to that sort of gaming? Because it's so amorphous. So what, what's the what's the reaction like to them, and how do they do? People escalate quickly, or do they try and solve the problem? What what's the what are the end states that sort of come out of that? Well, I would say that um, maybe the strongest representation of that was in the Baltic scenario, because you can see that it is very much um, on the border between the factions. And you can see that um, there is no kinetic action yet, but there is mm. influencing operations. So it is a very good point to model the dynamics there. And if you would take into account peacetime and um, at, at least uh, open dialogue between the two sides, you can notice what they would do within um, tactical level uh, confrontation. So that is what uh, I have done with the Baltic challenge. And we had groups that were proposing actions uh, based on their mission. And uh, if you ask me about the red team, uh, indeed, if it is an intelligent enemy, they will uh, propose a lot of positive actions because it is very difficult to counter them. So if you would do funding of different cultural events or demonstrations or art or education, then what would be the response that you can employ? You, of course, don't know at the time that it can have a, a well, hidden agenda, but it does. And we had evidence of that, for example, with NGOs that were uh, receiving funding from uh, Ministry of Defense of, uh, or Ministry of Foreign Affairs of uh, our neighbors. So obviously, they did have uh, hmm, other ideas than only uh, serving the peace and prosperity, you know, the classic uh, ideas. And in that case, uh, how you would um, identify it and um, counter it. We also played it out with Blue Team that you can also notice this is very realistic because they mostly preoccupy themselves with uh, sports events or parades or picnics, things like that. And uh, you have to ask yourself, what is the effectiveness of, of that other than creating contact with the local population? Uh, because uh, at least in the Baltic states, the support for NATO is already very high. So, okay, what's, what are you trying to achieve with that actions? Because they do not counter the ones that mm. they did before. And then we had also the white team that was representatives of different organizations, but the neutral ones. So they would not be aligned with either of the sides. And uh, in the book, I describe a curious case where uh, the UN won the Baltics. And the reason was that uh, neutral organizations had much higher credibility. So as I told you before, civilians tend to go for extremes. And if they are seeking neutrality against possible escalation because their peace and status quo is satisfying, then they would align themselves more with the neutral than with the blue team. And right. that's a space that can be very well leveraged, unfortunately, uh, if you don't know about that uh, dynamic. And in that case, you have to um, look at catalog of actions that can be mapped. And the Baltic challenge was played over a very long time, well, given the circumstances uh, of wargaming because uh, it was running for two, three years um, until my departure. I think it is still going on. So you could say that there is an outcome where they would map effectiveness of different uh, classes of actions uh, within that scenario of peacetime with um, under the threshold of war actions of uh, different groups, because uh, we also looked at state and non-state actors that are taking part in such manipulations. 
Uh, to clarify something that you were saying there, you're talking about the white team and that they want peace, right? So when you're saying that, do you mean that like they'll accept an occupation by maybe the red team if it's peaceful? Is that what you're kind of implying that the, the white team would go for? Something maybe blue team wouldn't be happy about, but the white team's okay with it as long as there's no violence? I or did I understand that wrong? Uh, well, um, let's say the um, circumstances that we have put the teams in was still peacetime. So that meant during peacetime, the the neutral organizations did not uh, choose a side yet, because I agree with you. There is a lot of scenarios where white team is operating on the occupied territory, and they. Um, they don't like to say, but they also work with uh, military forces present there. So uh, th that was not, let's say, the point to which we have uh, went because we did not escalate towards uh, open hostilities yet. We were just mapping uh, the Terrans peacetime and how the Red Team could gain influence that would open the doors for later um, mm. leverage. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they're trying they're trying to kind of influence things so they'll have a friendly white team. So instead of white team being friendly to the blue team, they'll be friendly to the red team when red team comes in. Okay, I get what you're saying now. Setting the table for the future. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, that makes sense. Now, spinning off uh, something that Kev had just ta asked you about, everybody's responses and stuff. Now you have all these different teams and staffs that are in war games, uh, and I would assume there's going to be a mix of sexes in those, male and female, uh, playing together in various roles in, in, in these games. And how well have you seen men and women work together, and do you see any tendencies uh, more from men than women and vice versa when they're in these environments? I would say that I never focused on it. So uh, <laughs> that would be the best case scenario where we are speaking about war gamers as a group. And I do not see uh, if, if the gender has influence on how they play the games or how they are perceived in the games. Mm -hmm. um, so I That's saw uh, different formats and I would also not say that there is a general rule about it. Of course, you can notice, and it's a fact that women do not. Um, yeah, they are a small portion of war gamers, so they do not exceed five percent or ten percent in mm -hmm. some uh, countries of the whole population, and that can create an effect on its own. But I think, uh, at least from my observations, it is growing over time. So I would not also. Um, drill into that because I'm not sure, let's say, what was the original reason for such small participation. Um, and I do not know that, so um, I would have to think about that. But I see positive <laughs> trends that it is uh, growing. And maybe the more women is shown, the more is attracted to it. So that's good. We have to yeah. start somewhere. In science, they call it the Scully effect. So when uh, the X-Files was released, there was not a lot of women scientists that were shown on the screen. And 20 years later, they traced back that just seeing a woman in that role made a lot of uh, girls go into STEM. Mm -hmm. And this, again, galloped throughout the time and um, just normalized um, this diversity and i would say the same is happening uh, in war gaming because that is what i have experienced uh, and this was a very open community and um, very open war gaming groups so i can only speak in positive terms about it which of course makes me very happy uh, but um, if that is a different experience for other women then i think it has to be uh, discussed as well and then um, addressed. So on my side, I can say that uh, women in wargaming are a rare creature, but uh, they are for me mm. people with uh, males that are playing. And I did not notice something about uh, their um, participation in wargames that was uh, drastically different mm -hmm. than men. 
I did see maybe a couple of anecdotes that can be uh, later also viewed. We had one <laughs> that uh, divided. So they said there will be a good cup and the bad cup. And which one would you say the woman played? Bad cup. Bad cup. <laughs> Why? <laughs> because <laughs> they she's like i want to be the bad cop i want to be the tough guy right Fair we're all married we know it's bad cop. <laughs> she was um basically presenting the aggressive style in negotiations and her male colleague was um, very calm and he tried to look for the uh, middle place that was quite interesting to see how that distributes <laughs> and that you know it immediately that's also fun <laughs> well, Kev 20 takes, years Kev's the white team on that one yeah yeah, I'm always 20, yeah 20 years from now we're going to call it the natalia effect instead of the scully effect getting more women exactly. into to war gaming they'll trace it back to this moment when she was on whiskey charlie there you go well, now, uh, with that said, do you go to, outside of professional war games, do you go to any conventions, any war game conventions? Those that are within my range, I would say. So uh, I was always in Essen, uh, but mm -hmm. uh, obviously this year we are a bit uh, yeah. suffering the effects of circumstances, so that is for now not possible. And um, yeah, I was in the different exchange uh, clubs as well as wargaming club that uh, it is not so prominent probably as US, but uh, it is still viable in Netherlands to meet together in a pub and play out uh, a war game. So uh, that is always fun. So what uh, war games are you playing? Well, uh, I have to say we didn't see each other for six months, so uh, that will come. Before that. <laughs> Yeah, actually, the last time that we uh, played, we had coin series. So we had uh, two free tables that were uh, playing different scenarios. And mm -hmm. we also, if I can, I bring my own uh, designs as well to test that because oh, cool. I get uh, tons of feedback. Like I saw this in the war game from 1950, so I cannot beat that amount. <laughs> repository that they have and uh, we exchange this way so we always show each other okay this is a good system this is interesting mechanic and it goes around now when you said coin games were there any specific coin games liberty or death perhaps not no not liberty or, or death uh, we played uh, fire in the lake i believe okay that's a good one and um, that was the case, but we have to see. I hope that we can do it somewhere in July uh, to squeeze in another war game. Well, that was a question that Harold had asked. That's why I was I was leading into this. Was how familiar are you with the you know the well known war game designers like Mark Herman, Volko Runka, uh, Uva Eichert, things like that? Harold Buchanan, uh, who did Liberty or Death, and uh, Mark and Volko did uh, the Fire in the Lake game. So. It's you already have experience with that one. Uh, and what type of games do you like? You know, operational, strategic, tactical. What do you enjoy the most? I'm uh, not discriminating any war game. So uh, actually, I like to uh, play around and test everything. Uh, so I also give a give a chance to um, any level of or scenario, maybe with the exception of um, I do not prefer the alternative Cold War endings uh, kind of games uh, because I think uh, the ending we had was uh, already uh, quite difficult. So uh, it can only get worse. Why are you playing it? <laughs> well, it's the whole what if the kinetic thing actually happened rather than what if the way it you know panned out happened. So it's I think it's that everybody's we had all these you know cool toys and tools we wanted to see what they would actually do in action versus you know in theory so still a war game is still theory true and uh, indeed i like from time to time to have a short uh, tactical game um for the fun of it uh, for the bigger games i think you also experience it that it is difficult to find somebody to play with mm -hmm. or maybe with uh, now the digital uh, improvements that will become easier 
And if I look at my own uh, gaming experience, that's quite funny because uh, other people noticed it about me earlier than I saw it. That, for example, I like uh, when cards are a component. Mm. So I, I didn't consciously notice it, but then when I looked at uh, the top 10 games that I have played out in the last years, uh, all of them have uh, cards in them. And I also like when you can win different ways. So you are not bound to one winning strategy and uh, basically you missed a step in the 16th row and then you are done with the game. So mm. that is quite annoying. And uh, indeed, I like to discover during the game that you can build up different things and um, they are possibly successful. And uh, when the game a bit shows you from the beginning who is in the lead and that that person wins, yeah, that is also not really building suspense. So there is kind of a couple of quirks that I like as a player, I have to add. Sir Harold, Harold has a comment. Nate, are you trying to hypnotize Kev with that twirl? <laughs> no. <laughs> My, uh, yeah, Next time he's trying to hit you in the head. <laughs> I got to admit, unfortunately, I did not have as much prep time uh, to get ready for this show as I normally do because my little boy broke his arm recently. So we've been in and out of the doctors, getting him a cast and all that stuff. And we got him a couple little toys and one of them, was this little purple slappy thing that is just addictive as hell to twirl it and slap it against things. So my apologies, guys. It, uh, I don't know. Well, you just that's your new nickname it. then. Yeah. I'm going to call you slappy from now on. Slappy. <laughs> Instead of Better spanking. Some of the nicknames I've <laughs> had. <laughs> so Sorry, we get, we get a little distracted sometimes. We're like kids. I mean, you know, squirrel. Hey, but um, now with all this stuff, everybody being in lockdown and all, have you, you did mention about digital gaming. Have you been able to get in, more involved in digital gaming uh, just for fun, whether it be with Euros or it be with war games? Uh, have you been able to do that during this whole lockdown? I am uh, conspiring to make one uh, with my <laughs> students from the Hague University. Uh, so we very much wanted uh, to do that somewhere June, July. And as soon as they are finished with their exams, I believe we can uh, play it out. So I wanted to do a crossover between a matrix game and kind of worker placement from um, the hobby side. So hmm. you would have more focused experience and um, it, your successful actions would cause you to have more actions, which um, can create asymmetric mechanics. And uh, that is something I want to work on uh, throughout the summer. And uh, let's see, hopefully release it as well as a PDF somewhere um, end of, of the summer. And it is uh, yeah, very much open format war game. So it could be played out um, on the table, but as well through Zoom or um, other tools that are readily available. Oh, very cool. Oh, so you haven't tried uh, things like Vassal or some of the games they have on Steam? Uh, I Yeah, that depends uh, indeed um, on the, what is the idea, because most of uh, the war games that I play are quite valuable because you do it with people, and I think you lose a bit uh, when you go online. But indeed, I imagine sometimes mm -hmm. it is the only option, or it can be... Uh, more comfortable because um, it takes care of the setup and the counters for you, so that is a big advantage. Uh, but I didn't uh, do that much because most of my war games were indeed uh, based on interaction. No, I don't blame you. I prefer to to see it, touch it, have it mm -hmm. in front of me rather than the digital. So I'm I'm 100% with you on that one. But a big key, like Natalia was saying, the big biggest key with this type of war gaming is the interaction you know we have interaction when we do these chats we have you know with the audience and with our guests and ourselves but it's really key in what she's doing with that type of war game to have you know people you know the, they're the biggest commodity in that game uh as far as the interactions they're you know cooperating together and planning and then also maybe throwing them off a little bit say hey this is what's going on hey there's some new intel and give them bad intel so now they've got to act on that and see how how they handle that and how that also you know 
moves the game forward. But uh, the biggest thing is just seeing how everybody, at least the, what, what I'm getting out of it, is trying to derive policies and procedures based on how people interact and how they react based on their knowledge, their understanding, and their area of expertise. Kev? Mate, uh, what's so funny? Harold. <laughs> Uh, look what at his did he comment. say now? What did he say? Now? Uh, asking if she had tried Twilight Struggle and what her opinion is on the greatest war game ever created. Have you ever played Twilight Struggle? Do you know what Twilight Struggle is, Natalia? I see it a lot, but I have not oh, played it. She's not played it. So we have to get you a copy of that. You have an iPad? That's because she's a war gamer and she doesn't necessarily need to play it. Either, or a resource placement. Well, she loves cards. Well, oh yeah, that, and that, that is one of the, Yeah, that's the top uh, card-based war game. It is Twilight definitely Struggle that. has a couple of cards in it. You'll like it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's very, very card-driven. Very interested, but indeed, it has the topic that I uh, would normally uh, avoid. So uh, I would have to uh, put myself in the right uh, thinking. Yeah. But it's actually about the Cold War. It's not post-Cold War. So it's not a hypothetical World War III. It's more of a, you're gaming out the Cold War. Could you change history? So in that regard, you may be interested in it. Yeah, because that one has more to do with the actual, like what she was talking about earlier, the influence blue and red were exerting rather than just strictly military forces, right? Because I hate to say it, I'm, I'm going to admit it, I haven't played Twilight Struggle, so I know some people are going to, Get a little perturbed in the comments. I just haven't got around to it. It's on my shelf, but I just haven't played it yet. It's a resource placement game, right? So, which one? It's a resource placement game. Well, which game is a resource placement? Twilight, Twilight, Twilight Struggle. Twilight. Oh. Okay. Well. You're basically going to get control of them. <laughs> Area control. So, I mean, it depends. Uh, everyone will. Right. It's the age old argument. Is it a war game? I'm <laughs> <laughs> If you uh, if you like card games, you should uh, definitely check it out because you can get it on a tablet for just a couple of bucks, and there's a a computer AI that runs the opponent. Just if you don't have someone to play with, mm -hmm. there's uh, there's that one to play. Yeah, yeah, you could definitely play. And you know, I gotta say, you are definitely if you ever come to the states, uh, definitely make sure to check out one of the war game uh, conventions that happen if you can come during the summer. WBC is a big one that's in July that lasts like 10 days or something like that in Pennsylvania, which would be closer to you. Uh, I know it's a long trek either way, but you want to try to stay East Coast, obviously. So uh, that one would be a good one. And if you do, make sure that you post it up there because there'll be a lot of people that'll come up to you and say hi and invite you to the table because you're welcome at my table anytime to play and me and Nate will be there. So we'll have fun. And if you are ever in Netherlands, then uh, this is an invitation here. Nice. Fantastic. How far are you from uh, Amsterdam? One hour. Hey, yeah, there we go. I can. But uh, well, we can't go now. <laughs> well, Nobody yeah. in the world wants the U.S. anywhere. Right and take Twilight Struggle with you, then we can uh, test there it. There you go. Are you guys just out of curiosity? Are you guys on restriction? Like, are you allowing uh, foreigners to travel into your country right now? That is a good question. I think there is a EU wide. Um, I don't want to call it sanctions. There are some measures that they took uh, to control uh, the flow of uh, people, and uh, it is very much based on the country. Um, and let's say the level of how well the country is dealing with um, COVID. So how many new infections you have and um, whether yeah, your response is uh, effective. So I think that it is uh, EU wide, uh, unfortunately, that um, US citizens are uh, controlled or limited in their movements. Um, but for Netherlands, uh, I have to say that the results are improving. So the measures are also now um, decreased. Well, I hope everything sticks well for you guys. Same so, for you. Harold says that he predicts Natalia would love Twilight Struggle. 
So there you now go. I have to play it. <laughs> and David says, don't get Harold worked up because Harold's talking all kinds of stuff over here. I think he really did must have triggered him because he's saying, do you ever war game with against zombies? It's like, who doesn't? <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell a lot of the people that watch this are all war game designers? Harold, David, all of them in there design war games, so they're very much intrigued right now, and they're all telling you which the best are. And Dave has a comment there that he says the Netherlands is home to my family's favorite place on planet Earth. Now I'm going to probably screw this up. It's either Efteling or Efteling. Well, the, the Dutch it's neither, right? I can also show probably how not to say it because uh, I only speak Dutch for two years, but uh, they have instead of ge, a ge, so maybe they would say Efteling. Ah, okay. So that wasn't too bad, too bad off. Don't cite me on that. <laughs> there we go. Well, close enough for government work I mean, or for war gamer work, I guess. Now, we, we only like to make sure that we get our pronunciations correct. Gav, did you have another question? I'm great. He's great. So Kev is great. We know that. He's the war game wizard from Oz. Now we have to come up with a nickname for Natalia. Definitely. And uh, anytime you have a topic that uh, you think I could bring something interesting in, just uh, let me know. Well, she yeah, already definitely. said her nickname earlier. What Scully. is it? Scully. Scully. Yeah, well, that's a Scully effect. Now, the Natalia effect will be next. But the one thing I, I would like to ask is, do you have any plans? You were talking about um, getting... Uh, you know, with your uh, people at, at the school together to come up with a war game. Now, do you have any plans in the future, maybe, uh, of uh, doing something like that open to the wargaming public where you would bring in a certain amount of wargamers and just run them through a simple game just to see how wargamers would handle it? I think that that's a really good proposal that uh, I will add to that plan. So... Uh... I think it is a very good comparison between war gamers and students. I did that with the previous games because it shows you what is more instinctively understood and what is more advanced uh, mm -hmm. knowledge or angle on things. Uh, so that uh, sounds like a good uh, addition. And um, yeah, maybe I will just uh, announce it somewhere on Twitter or. I'm on in. <laughs> If you have two hours that you can spare, that could be quite fun. Yeah, no, I think that'd be a lot of fun. Sounds yeah. fun. Well, definitely, me and Kevin, in. Nate, you in? I'm always willing. I'm always in. We're gonna and we're gonna bring in Harold just because I know he's gonna want to get in on this, and I don't want him bursting a you know blowing an aneurysm here or something like that on the chat. <laughs> so we'll bring in Harold uh, too as well. Uh, well. Actually, I think he left. So Robert says that Natalia is the Jack Ryan of wargaming. Jackie mm -hmm. Ryan, I should, I guess we should say. Well, I had a running joke with my colleague because um, I we were just waiting at the airport uh, to get into the plane at one of our travels, and I asked them, uh, "Do you know what is my second name?" Because it was on the ticket, and for some reason he responded, "Jack." So that fits Natalia Jack Vojtovich for some reason. And there you go. Stuck around for the next two years. So, uh... Nate, do you have uh, a last question here for Natalia? No, I'm good. I just got to say I appreciate you coming on and chatting yes. with us. You did great. It really educational, teaching us some stuff from the professional side we didn't know before. I really appreciate you taking the time to do that. Thanks. Absolutely. Bye was a great experience for me. So I think it will open a new chapter in the next volume. There you go. Well, now we oh. definitely... Kev, go ahead. No. Oh, I thought you were saying something. I didn't want to cut you off. I was, I was just excited that uh, there's a, a, a new chapter. Maybe we reference in it, Mark. There you go. Nice. We'll, we'll, we'll get all of us into, into her next book. But no, uh, definitely let us know about if you plan on doing something online, because I know we would all definitely love to be involved in that. And I know there's some people in the audience that would as well. So the bigger you make it, the more people will definitely come in. And I'm sure that when the call gets out there for other war gamers, they're going to be like, yeah, I'm in, you know, so uh, I think it'd be something, it'd be a great experience. I think it's a great experiment too, for you uh, from an academic perspective to do something like that and see how it all plays out with just a bunch of war gamers. And uh, I think it'd be a lot of fun, but Natalia really appreciate you taking the time tonight. It is uh, 
over, you know, 3.15 a.m. in the Netherlands right now. So uh, don't want to keep you up all night. I know that everybody's asked questions. I tried to get as many of them as I could in. Wanted to get our questions in. Wanted to let you uh, get your say, but definitely don't want to keep you up all night. Really appreciate you taking the time to tell you. Thanks a lot for coming on. And everybody, thank you for your questions. And uh, we will see you guys next time on the next episode of Whiskey Charlie. Have a good night. Take care.